Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. So this video is going to run through factors which can influence the effects and responses of what we call low pressure weather systems. And if you're studying GCSE geography, this is referred to as tropical storms in many GCSE specifications. Now before we start, let me draw your attention to the description box below where you can access worksheets that you can complete while going through this video. And they are to help you either um, create a nice set of revision notes or to support you if you're learning from home. Now more often than not we are constantly seeing reports now of low pressure weather systems hitting various regions and locations around our planet. And when these countries experience low pressure weather systems such as hurricanes, cyclones and typhoons they bring unfortunately a lot of damage and cause a lot of effects or impacts. Things happen as a result. And then quite a lot of these locations, countries, governments will try to respond to these impacts, the, the damage that has been caused. And as geography students, you will first of all need to understand what we call case study knowledge, location examples and specific facts and figures linked to specific examples of low pressure weather systems. So for example, some of you might have studied Hurricane Sandy in your geography lessons that occurred in October of 2012 and affected a lot of countries within the Caribbean Sea as well as the United States of America. But alternatively, you may have studied Typhoon Haiyan that occurred in November 2013. And I know Typhoon Haiyan is very popular amongst those of you who study AQA, GCSE Geography. And this particular typhoon affected the Philippines. Now, if we then were to compare our, our locations and our case study knowledge and all of those impacts and damage we can see, first of all, we'll start with some photographs. That the damage that these low pressure weather systems cause may look similar when we are seeing the reports on the news. We know that low pressure weather systems, your typhoons, your hurricanes, your cyclones, they destroy houses, they maybe will damage power lines, they will create what we call storm surges and therefore create flooding. But when we really look at these case study examples in more detail, and compare the specific impacts that are caused, we see a completely different picture. So if you look, for example, Hurricane Sandy on the left, we've got $71 billion worth of damage. But when we compare that to Typhoon Haiyan, we're looking at $5.8 billion worth of damage. Again, Hurricane Sandy, 286 people killed. But when you actually compare that to Typhoon Haiyan, that number might be significantly more. Hurricane Sandy had 346,000 houses damaged, with 8.5 million homes and businesses left without power. But when you compare that to Typhoon Haiyan, we ended up with 1.9 million people being left homeless because their houses were damaged or destroyed in that event. So when we compare our case studies, we are seeing different impacts, different effects. And that ultimately might mean we need to respond to these low pressure weather events in a very different way. So like I said, we need to be thinking about what factors could influence the effects. Why is Hurricane Sandy experiencing a different amount of damage? in terms of statistics and numbers compared to Typhoon Haiyan. So if we think first of all about transport infrastructure, so we're thinking there about roads, we're thinking about train lines, we're thinking about connections to other places. The better the transport network within a particular region or country, the quicker it is to potentially evacuate the residents that live in that area. And therefore, that would reduce the effects being felt by low pressure weather systems like hurricanes, cyclones and typhoons. Because if the people are able to evacuate very quickly because the transport infrastructure is very reliable, then we're going to have a reduced amount of number of people being injured, people being killed. That also will mean that aid and help and assistance and emergency services can access the area 
quicker and more effectively. Because if that transport infrastructure is reliable, well made, well constructed, your emergency services like ambulances, paramedics are able to enter those areas and also help the people who are injured or trapped and hopefully will reduce that loss of life. If we then start to think about resources and finance, the more resources and money available within this particular area being affected by hurricane cyclones or typhoons, the, the quicker it is to rebuild homes and businesses. So for example, whenever hurricanes affect the United States of America, the United States of America will provide money to those local areas to help people rebuild their homes and businesses to get back on their feet. And therefore people are able to make an income to support their livelihoods in a much faster turnaround compared to other countries that may struggle financially. Training and education also comes into this because if you have a better education, you are more likely to know what to do in the event of a low pressure weather system. You will know that you need to evacuate or maybe you need to grab essential supplies in case you're injured or caught off guard. And also, if you have good training in your country, that means emergency services will know what to do in relation to the impacts that are being caused, which will hopefully reduce loss of life and casualties. The medical facilities also come into play here because the more medical resources, doctors, nurses, hospitals and medication you have available within your region or country, the easier it is for victims to get treatment. More often than not, your low income countries may struggle with the amount of people that are needed to distribute these medical resources. And that can unfortunately lead to injuries that are more severe leading to someone losing their life. We also have to factor in population density within a particular area. And population density means the amount of people who live in that area. So if we have a dense population, we have a higher potential risk of people being injured or fatalities and deaths being caused because there's a high number of people in the area that are at risk to being, you know, in, in the path of these low pressure weather systems. Whereas if we have a, a low population density with a smaller population within the region, we have a, a reduced risk of injury because of less people being in the area. We have to then consider construction standards within our regions and countries. Buildings with strict building regulations, particularly in your high income countries, have less chance of collapsing because they have building regulations and laws they need to follow. This isn't always the case in some low income countries, but please don't think that all low income countries have poor construction standards. That's not always the case. But you are more likely to see poor constructed buildings made of poor quality materials in your low income countries compared to your high income countries. We also have to factor in governments and corruption. And countries, unfortunately, they're experiencing corrupt governments and organisations that are being given charity and help from, from various locations and countries and organisations. And money is being passed to them through charity money to help victims and casualties of these low pressure weather systems. When you have a corrupt government, they will divert, they will take that money, but not give it to the people that it needs to go to or the areas it needs to go to. And instead, they will divert those supplies away from the areas that need it most. And unfortunately, this can again result in increased number of casualties and fatalities. Emergency services within the area also need to be highly skilled in order to reduce the number of casualties. And some locations might have a very small amount of emergency services that are available to them. Whereas other countries have really strong, well-trained emergency services that have been established for generations and years to come. So the more skilled emergency services, such as your armies, your paramedics and volunteers, this will result in reduced number of casualties within these particular events.
We also have to consider the time and the day of the week that these particular events occur on because we might have buildings and roads collapsing when they're empty, which reduces the amount of casualties. But if a potential low pressure weather system occurs in the middle of the week, the working week, or peak transport times during the day when people are traveling to work, you're going to see an increased number of people at risk of these injuries or fatalities and losing their lives. Distance always factors in here as well with low pressure weather system because the closer you are to the, the center of your, your hurricane, your typhoon or your cyclone, the greater the intensity of the winds. If you're on the periphery or the outskirts of these low pressure weather systems, you're not going to experience as intense wind speeds and therefore the effects you're hopefully going to see in the area will not be as severe as other areas of a closer proximity to the eye of the storm. The type of event is also something we need to factor in here as well because low pressure weather systems will bring secondary effects such as flooding and storm surges as well as obviously intense high winds. And finally we've got building density. So again just like population density the more buildings we have in an area the greater the likelihood that some will collapse unfortunately or be damaged or items may be ripped from the sides of buildings which will again increase people's risk on ground level. But if we have an area with a low building density, there is less likely chance of buildings collapsing. So as always, everyone, I hope you found this video useful. Like and subscribe if you did, and I'll see you next time.